It is a uh, pleasure to welcome to the program Professor John D. Erickson. He is a professor of sustainability science and policy at the University of Vermont, author of The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. Uh, professor, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Let's uh, let's start with just the um, the idea of well, I, I mean, just the, the the progress illusion, I guess. I mean, because one of the things that we've been trying to do at this uh, show for for quite some time is uh, to make people to understand that um, e economics is really it's just it, we're just making choices, um, and uh, 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 th there is no necessarily no. Um, economics that exists outside of different people's ideas of what the economics should be of a place. Will you talk about that uh, progress illusion? Um, and I also, is it also an allusion to, uh, to Freud's future of an illusion? Because there seems to be sort of like, you know, a fairy tale quality that is being critiqued in both. Yeah. I mean, this book is a, is a reflection on the kind of economics that I was I grew up on the kind of economics that was taught, the kind of economics that is in, expressed in our policy and in our institutions. And it's a kind of economics that's highly individualistic, right? It's all about the person, about the individual. It's an economics built on a kind of morality of greed, right? You remember the Michael Douglas movie, uh, Wall Street in the 80s, greed is good, the Gordon Gecko character, right? It's a kind of economics that's also designed to make choices at the margin. Like we put a lot of emphasis in economics on marginal costs and marginal benefits, the next choice, right? If the next choice creates more benefits than costs, then you do it. It's like this rational actor model of economics. Yet we know that when all those small choices are added up together, they result in a future that we never would have voted for. We know that when you put all of choice on the back of the individual and kind of hope and pray that humans are rational creatures, we know that doesn't come true. These are kind of fairy tales that we perpetuate in our economics cur curriculum, in our business schools, in our political science programs. It's a kind of fairy tale that we have to upend and replace with an economics that, oh, maybe comes to terms with some biophysical realities of the planet comes to terms with who we are as humans, not this caricature of, of what we call in economics, believe it or not, homo economicus, this sort of subspecies of human. So the fairy tales are many and the progress illusion is about overturning them. Well, how would you, I mean, when, when you, when, uh, are, are there, are there multiple, I mean, how ideological is, is this? I mean, as uh, how, uh, how much of our economics is a function of ideology and how much of it is uh, an, an ideology that is um, promulgated by people who are going to, who have set up a system so that, the, that, that there's an attempt to make it seem like it's a, just simply a rational or a pre-existing, uh, you know, an essential reality uh, versus one that is coincidentally uh, also going to put a certain class of people at, top, at the top. Yeah, I mean, economics is, is built on ideology. Any, any brand of economics is built on ideology. Uh, the question is, you know, who, what kind of economics is built for who and for what purpose? And this comes back to the sort of central notion of economic growth, the holy grail of gross domestic product. Yet we never ask growth for who, growth for what purpose, and growth for how long. The entire ideology, particularly of the mainstream, which is what I'm taking on in this book, the mainstream especially since reflected um, since the, what we call the neoliberal turn of the late 70s, early 80s, the mainstream ideology of economics is built to sort of support the notion of trickle down. It's built to support the notion of we don't have to ask, are there differences between necessities and luxuries? We don't ever have to ask about, you know, redistributing income or redistributing effort. We don't have to ask like, who owns the products of production and why, it's all sort of taken as a given. And therefore, this kind of market fundamentalism is taken as, quote unquote, natural instead of something that humans design with particular purpose and particular humans in mind. Um, let's just let, let's start with talking about um, uh, uh, GDP. 
Mm. Um, let, let's talk about how we calculate this, because I'm uh, uh, old enough to remember that in the wake of um, the fall of the Soviet Union, that there was, a, there, there seemed to be a brief moment, I feel like it was in 90, I don't, I, you know, 93 maybe, mm-hmm. of, of an idea of recalculating the GDP. Yeah. Uh, and then it just sort of went away. Um, but, 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 but tell us, how do we calculate the GDP? What is uh, problematic about it? So there's been many of these moments of rethinking GDP, of redesigning GDP. It's become kind of the holy grail of progress in society. It's calculated as price times quantity. How much stuff do we make, right, times its price? And to some extent, your material well-being, right, how much a society consumes and produces is part of your progress, is part of your well-being, but only up to a point. And we also have to ask, what does it count and what does it miss? So, I mean, you can go back, for example, to Senator Robert Kennedy in 1968 had this famous speech about how GDP sort of counts nothing (laughs) that is most important to us as fathers, as mothers, as citizens, as communities. Um, It counts things like, you know, wildfires and the cost to rebuild communities and homes as a good thing. It counts oil spills as a good thing. It doesn't count things like unpaid care at home. It doesn't count trade-offs between our leisure leisure and our labor. Um, It misses so many things, yet is held up as the kind of um, the, the, the one true indicator of progress of a society. And when you go through the effort, as we have have in the field of ecological economics, of teasing out what is a benefit in terms of what we spend money on and what is a cost, especially regrettable costs, teasing out the the distribution of the benefits and costs of a growing economy. We find when you do the math that the United States has been in a progress recession since the late 1970s. All right, let's uh, let's get a little more concrete with yeah. with that so that we can understand what 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 that means because I mean and, and like you say just another, you know, classic example that uh, that I've always understood is that you know, if I get robbed, somebody busts my door down in my house yep. and they steal all my stuff, um that's going to benefit the GDP. Great for um, the economy. <laughs> it's great because I got to go back out. I got to buy all this stuff again. I got to hire somebody to repair mm-hmm. my door. But the cost to me in terms of my time, the cost for me in terms of my sense of security, the cost for me in terms of like, you know, uh, the, the, the sense of like, oh, I, you know, that was a family heirloom. None yeah. of that is regarded whatsoever. My, right. my, my overall happiness whether this, you know, in the time I got to take off of work, and so I don't, uh, you know, whatever, I, I miss the big meeting and I don't have the chance to do the proposal. None of that is, is, is accounted for in this. So what is, what, when you say that we're in a progress recession, what, what does that mean? Like what constitutes progress in your, uh, uh, you know, I guess, sure, uh, sure. a type of economics? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, how does the economy contribute to our well-being? Right. So, of course, consumption contributes to our well-being. Right. Um, We want to be able to afford the necessities of life. We want to be able to afford a roof over our head and food on the table and our kids to have good health care and uh, a good life. But um, so much of what we spend money on, your example of getting robbed, is a regrettable expense. Right. To rebuild homes after disaster is a regrettable expense. Um, to, to spend money on health care um, as a sort of defense to having chemicals in our food system <laughs> is a regrettable expense. So we should really understand not just the quantity of the economy, which is what GDP is great at calculating, but the quality of that economy. We should be able to answer the question, that next unit of growth, which is where economists love to live at the next unit, did it create more benefits than costs? And if it didn't, and we're not counting the costs, we're only counting the benefits, then maybe we've entered an era of what my colleague and mentor Herman Daly called uneconomic growth, right? Where each new unit of growth is creating more costs than benefits. Why would any sane society continue to sort of expand an economy in a way that creates more costs than benefits? Because... (laughs) 
The benefits are concentrated into the hands of the few and the costs are spread on everyone else, including future generations. GDP has done that really well. Other metrics have started to point to the loss of quality of life, the loss of well-being. I mean, what are we celebrating? We're the biggest economy in the world, but we have the highest poverty rate amongst rich countries. We have one of the highest suicide rates in the world. Um, our, our children are now dying more from guns than anything else. All of those things are great for a growing, expanding economy, but are they good for our well-being? Are they good for peace and prosperity? Is there uh, the relationship between like an expanding economy? I mean, is there a way, how would you recalculate this? In other words, sure. um, if we're looking at like a situation where, um, uh, let's say a company like, like DuPont, uh, they, they're, they're pouring their C8 into the water. So, I mean, this is a, this was a, you know, a case that was, that was, uh, that uh, widely known. They're pouring their uh, chemical into the waters instead of like burning it like they're supposed to. Um, they're making more money. Yeah. They're, you know, their, their revenue is up. Uh, their shareholders get more money. They go out and spend more stuff. But of course, other people are uh, dying of cancer. Um, right. And that begins, but they've got to spend money on the cancer treatment. Um, they've got to uh, maybe hire somebody to help them, you know, uh, w w deal with their uh, their sickness, et cetera, et cetera. GDP just keeps going up because of all of those, those things. Right. Um, but how would, what costs would you, and how would you, like, how would you re-calculate uh, um, uh, that real world equation into an economic equation? Sure, sure. So the, the Biden administration is going down this path, actually. Um, they have this, this cross-government approach where they're trying to understand that the very dependence on the health of an economy on the health of the environment, right? So to really start to elucidate some of those, exactly some of those trade-offs, because right now, the expansion of an economy or a business enterprise or the creation of a product, all those benefits are easy to count. What did it sell for? How many jobs did it create? What was what, what taxes were paid? But the costs, right, the depletion of the environment, the pollution of the environment, those are all either ignored, right, or the insanity of it is, is that when we deplete our soils, when we pollute our waters, when we spew pollutants into the atmosphere, those are largely ignored. Um, this, this comes down to a kind of economics that really should be more thoughtful about the balance between private benefits and costs and public benefits and costs. And all of this is by design. Um, under the kind of Reagan revolution, right, there was this executive order passed, uh, executive order 12291, that mandated, right, that we do economic cost benefit analysis on all public policy. The implication of that is it's really easy to count the benefits of a growing economy and very difficult to count the costs. And so that therefore ushered in a whole system, a whole ideology that says privatize everything. Mm. Everything that matters is what's measured in the marketplace. And if we can't measure it in the marketplace, then it doesn't matter. So is the that, kind, yeah, would you ca call please. that the financialization of growth? Yes. I mean, I, that's that's where I feel like we're kind of zeroing in on is growth in sectors that benefit people more broadly and are not concentrated at the top. It is not incentivized in the same way that financialized growth is, which is uh built on the mil myth of endless growth under capitalism that really only b benefits the people at the top who are hoarding the wealth that comes from any growth in that area thank you for that yeah all, all economics and all economies are an expression of a society's values and in doing research for this book i dug up an old qu quote from margaret thatcher who said economics are the method the object is to change the heart and soul right so when we think to the kind of economics that I was indoctrinated in through the 80s and 90s, the kind of economics that we teach our young people today is meant to change the heart and soul, is meant to educate consumers, right? Not citizens. 
is meant to sort of financial your, your your thing about financialization right it's meant to say all things of value are in dollar terms and if it's not in dollar terms then it doesn't count yet i remind my students we wrote the clean air act the clean water act the endangered species act the national environmental policy act uh, the civil rights act right all all of these kind of progressive hallmarks of the u.s legal system didn't have an economic cost calculus built into them we did those things because they were morally right to do we did those things based on science informed democracy we did those things because the economy is meant to be our servant not our master we have flipped everything around in the last few decades and so is the is the fix a a way is it about recalculating so that we have like you know both let's say you know uh, that we're 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 actually sure. accounting for all economic account uh, you know activity and maybe even putting a number to like hey when you know sam has to spend 2 hours um uh you know or 10 hours or or 50 hours trying to get his door fixed and his, you know, the his TV back and his computer and he lost all those photos. We're going to put a number on that. And that's going to, uh, uh, you know, we're going to put that on the cost side of the ledger uh, and put it against the sort of like uh, whatever the, re the, the economic activity, uh, you know, yep. the revenue generating side for other people. And that's going to balance it out. I mean, is that the answer? I think it's part of the answer. I think it's a transition strategy of kind of, if you play by the current rules of the game, you're going to have to put a dollar value on things, right? And so we've done this in Vermont. We've passed into law a genuine progress indicator where we go through and systematically take the GDP accounts for Vermont and walk through it and say, this is a benefit, this is a cost, a regrettable expense. These are things like the value of household work that aren't counted. Here's the adjustment for income distribution and wealth distribution, right? And we go through and meticulously, like a national income accountant would do, make those changes for this one metric of how Vermont asks the question, how well are we doing? Speaking of how well we're doing, my lights went off because we're trying to, we're trying to save energy here. <laughs> um, so that, I think that's one way to do it. But we also have to recognize that not, not all values, not all decisions should be weighted by cost benefit calculus, right? That part of this um, reorientation of an economics that's fair and just and sustainable is about starting to reprioritize our values, right? Make the economy work for us, not the other way around. Uh, there's been so many warnings through the years. Uh, Carl Polanyi in the 1950s wrote this book called The Great Transformation. And he worried about the coming market society, right? where the society is run by the rules designed and written by economists. And I fear that's what's happening, right? Instead of sort of debating and creating a democracy that frames and, and controls an economic system versus the other way around. Well, well so where do we, we, I, I'm struck by like the sort of the, the absence of like, a, 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 of, of just even uh, mentioning capitalism. Like, our, I mean, our, in, 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 and so what is the, the, the solution here? I mean, uh, when we talk about like, you know, um, our, our values, like, I mean, frankly, I'm not sure, I, I don't know where we would land on, on our values necessarily in the context of, of our country, uh, you know, these days. <laughs> um, but what, what, why no mention of capitalism and why, like, where, where are we headed with the the, sure. the critique that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, ca capitalism is is the the uh, the elephant in the room, right? Cap a capitalism system is one where the market decides on how to allocate resources, and the resources are owned by cap capitalists, right, by individuals. And so, what we've done is we've built an economic system that forsakes all other values and other choices and just fits them into the mold of economic choice and market choice and market fundamentalism. Um, all of the kind of adjustments through the years of economics that have tried to bring economics back into balance with other values of society. I mean, Keynes did this in the 30s and 40s and 50s, and he called it wisely managed capitalism, right? Where you really have government institutions. <laughs> that supersede the capitalism framework, right? Um, 
the environmental movement was all about kind of reining in the, all of these feedback systems in the capitalistic model where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, where capital is has all of these costs that aren't accounted for. So uh, whether it's you want to call it democratic socialism or wisely managed capitalism or a new system of governance that is more bottom up than top down, this ultimately comes back to your original point of, is about taking power back, right? Is about who manages the economy and for what purpose? Who does the economy benefit and for how long? So, what is the uh, the the goal? Is this a is this a uh, is this ultimately a degrowth argument, or is this a reorient um, the way? I mean, frankly, in a more efficient way, our our resources. I mean, we we produce as a as a as a world, you know, something like twenty five percent more food than we need. It just doesn't go to the right places, and a lot of it's wasted. We have um, we have the we we like you say we're the wealthiest nation on earth in the history of earth. Uh, yet we have uh, all sorts of extreme poverty. We have homelessness. We have things that don't exist in countries that are ostensibly less wealthy than us. Right. And that is really ultimately a function of of redistribution, isn't it? It is, but it's also pre-distribution, right? It's how do we design the system uh, to begin with? And, and that's what this is about. Um, the current economic system and the current economics that we teach was built for a different time and for a different purpose, right? It was, it was built in that kind of early stage capitalism where growth was the mandate, right? I mean, all of the kind of macroeconomics that we teach was born out of the necessity of the Great Depression to get people back to work. And it was quantity, quantity, quantity. And, and don't worry about anything else until we, until we grow the economy. Um, 21st century is different. There's way more people, right? There's much of a bigger, bigger environmental problem. There's the climate crisis, crisis. There's biodiversity loss. There's growing inequality, right? We have to step back and say, this economics that we teach, we call it neoclassical economics that was crafted in the late 1800s. Is it fit for mission, right? Is it the kind of economics that fits the kinds of problems that we have today? Mm -hmm. So this is a real re, about the book is about a reprioritization of our goals of the economy. But, First and but, foremost, it's oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no, no. I, I thought I did not mean to cut you off. Yeah, I'll do ahead. one, two, three real quick. First, yeah. first is, is we should be teaching our economics that ask the question, how big should the economy be? Right. So this is your point, Sam, about a degrowth. Right. If we've grown an economy that's especially in Western countries that are creating more costs and benefits, what are we doing? <laughs> right. So the scale of the economy is an important question for the 21st century that was ignored in the 1800s. Once we sort of figure out what the right size of the economy should be, we've built an economic system that fails unless it's growing. So we therefore have to really rethink that as well. Who gets the benefits and who gets the costs of a right sized economy? Then we can come back to the economist specialty of efficiency, right? That we want to create a system that is efficient and well run and well tuned. Economists are well equipped to be folks that were trained like me, to be the janitors of the market, to be the plumbers of the market, to be the mechanics of the market. But we weren't trained to be the sort of social planners of everything, to be the lords of society. And I'm afraid that's that's where we positioned ourselves. But I, I guess where I get confused is when you talk about like the scale of the economy or you talk yeah. about growth or not growth, these are fictionalized concepts anyways, right? I mean, like we have decided... You know, like if if I want to measure, have I grown? Is my son my has my son who's who's ten? Has he grown right. in the uh, in the past three years? The the measure I can choose uh, to measure whether he's grown is I can take a, a ruler and I can see how tall he is. Yep. The other yep. way I could do that is just by mass, or I could do it by you know how thick he is, or I could just look at his hair and decide that's how I'm going to decide his growth. Right. Or I can say, like, is he more mature? Uh, how, how sophisticated is his language become? There's, we, we have a situation, it seems to me, that, the, that you're, you're laying out that we've chosen one measure of, of assessing growth that uh, ostensibly is considered beneficial. And perhaps at one time it was, but it is no longer beneficial 
to society to measure growth in that manner. And so is the question really that whether we're looking for growth or not growth, or rather, are we looking for um, the idea of like, uh, just simply a different measurement, which will then implicate the values that we have chosen to assess there. So like, you know, if I decide that I want, I'm going to measure growth by height because yeah, yeah. we live in a society where everything is at a, a certain shelf level. And you know, that's the most important thing. Uh, then that's the way I'll do it. But if it really is more about, you know, how much hair you have or whatever it is, then, then we do it another way. Like, I, like I get confused between the, the, the concept that we, have chosen a measure of growth that is really only that is it's sort of a fraudulent sales pitch for benefits for a specific set of people in the in in, in our society yeah. versus the idea of like growth is bad well look so so back to we don't ask the question when we do our books as a nation we don't ask the question growth for who growth for what purpose and growth for how long? So take your son, right? <laughs> is he going to grow forever, right? Is 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 does he get all the growth and none of your other kids can grow, right? Like, growth is a physical concept, and to imagine that we can infinitely grow a person, a house, a nation, a globe, infinitely in a finite planet, is fairy tale thinking. Why do we continue to sort of teach that fairy tale? Because we only count the benefits and ignore the costs. Because we only care about who the benefits go to in terms of the, the folks who own the capital and get to make the decisions over the system, right? And we ignore the, the democracy that's behind the scenes that's been deprioritized. But, Growth is a physical concept. It has trade-offs. We don't teach that in economics. <laughs> we don't teach that a global national economy has trade-offs in the social costs of growth and the ecological costs of growth. Emma, sorry. No, it's okay. I, I'm just, I'm, I'm energized by the discussion because I, I, I felt like, you know, earlier we did establish how so much of growth, though, is kind of bullshit, for, for lack of a better word. It's based on financialization. For who and for what purpose? That's the question. Right? right. But but then that's not physical in any real way, right? That's just wealth hoarding. And so then I think it comes back to a question of wealth re redistribution, the, the leftist and socialist concern about degrowth is that we uh, when we don't come at it from a ca anti-capitalist perspective, the, mm -hmm. the brunt of degrowth is going to be felt by people at the bottom. And yeah. I mean, I, I, I th that's, I guess, kind of what I, I, I'd love to get your thoughts on. Right. No, if you don't if you don't take on who, who owns capital and, and, and how, if you don't take on more cooperative arrangements or building a care economy or recognizing all of the other work that happens to build a well-being in society. And if you just take take the current system and degrow, then the most vulnerable inside you're going to get hurt. So the, the question is around transition. How do we orchestrate a just transition to a right-sized economy? How do we create a more nimble, smaller economy that doesn't fundamentally depend on growth? Because folks like me who are doing the math on the ecological side of things around climate change and soil loss and water pollution and, and the very air that we breathe are sort of recognizing that the system is going to be downsized either by disaster or by design. So the kind of economics that we would like to build in this century is an economics that downsizes and right sizes the economic system by design that does it that centers justice, that centers equity, that asks the kinds of questions you're asking around financialization. Because mm. yeah, financialization makes all this kind of money from money and money from nothing. But all that money, all that spending power has an ecological expression, right? It results in airplanes and flights and spending. And, and then you, you measure that, the spending that we do as a society against well-being metrics against surveys like the Gallup poll or surveys on life satisfaction or surveys on well-being. And we recognize that we're growing like crazy and well-being has been flat or in decline. Right. Or that we're growing. The United States is growing in a certain style that's very privatized and very lopsided. 
And our metrics on poverty and on mental health and on obesity don't measure up to other kinds of, of models uh, across the ocean. I feel like uh, we're, we may need another uh, another hour to get to this, but but I guess like you, the thing that I'm getting hooked, uh, you know, uh, caught up on is is yeah. the, sort of the same sort of a point I think that Emma is making is that if growth is just a concept, like I mean, it, it, like for instance, okay, you mentioned airplanes, right? We're flying all over the place. Well, what if we decided as a society in or in this country that yeah. um, we're going to uh, um, heavily regulate airplanes? Uh, there's only going to be uh, flights. You, there are no more hour-long flights in this country. Uh, they're only going to be, let's say, um, you know, three-hour flights. Mm -hmm. And what we're going to do is we're going to build high-speed rail, and we're going to build, um, you know, more uh, uh, more public transportation, and we're going to go back to really the sort of like the 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 railway system we had 150 years ago or 100 years ago in this country. Um, and we're going to, uh, develop technologies. Um, I, you know, I, I'm just uh, throwing it out there, but, uh, let's say, you know, uh, nuclear power that is going to provide electricity for these things. Um, I have some issues with, with nuclear power, but I'm just using this as, a, as an example. Um, and as a society, we're going to essentially, you know, flatten things. Uh -huh. Airlines only very limited use more public transportation that's going to theoretically grow the economy right i mean we're going to see like this this huge industry uh and we're going to employ a lot more people uh on these railway lines and we're going to have a lot more uh, activity because people are going to be able to travel more uh and it's going to be uh the the travel is going to be open to a, a broader swath of people what what what's did, is that what you're talking about, or is that problematic in, no, in the perspective? You're giving examples of, of striking a new kind of balance. You're giving examples of growing certain activities and degrowing other activities, right? You're giving an example of, of providing people with more choice, for example, with transportation, not less. You're giving an example. I mean, if we're imagining a society that's fit for purpose and a society that's fit with what the planet can support, we're probably looking at a decentralization of, of power and production, right? We're looking at a relocalization of economic of, of, of economic systems. We're looking at systems that are still interconnected through trade, right? But not trade for, for plastic toys from toys from China. Trade for things that actually improve people's lives. Um, we're looking at a kind of creating a well-being economy, right? A well-being economy that prioritizes sufficiency, that prioritizes, you know, take the sustainable development goals, you know, that nearly all the world's countries have agreed upon, right? That prioritizes a good life that is fits within the means of the planet, right? This is the question to ask in 2023, not in 1823. The question to ask is how do we create a good life within our means? Um, and that's the kind of economics that we're trying to create and, and, uh, and build. Um, an, an economics that's based in biophysical reality, um, an economics that um, centers social equity and justice, an economics that just doesn't just like a, a roll of the dice and, you know, hey, whoever, whoever wins with the most stuff dies the happiness, the happiest, which just ain't true, right? You look at all the social ecological research, right? Um, the bloated economies like the United States aren't taking care of, of our own people, of our own citizens, yet we're still on this kind of treadmill and we're all stuck in these rat races and we're, we're sort of running around and around and around the hamster wheel saying growth will solve the problems that growth creates. What happens now? What do we do next? Don't worry, growth will solve the problems that growth creates, right? Instead of asking the questions around redistribution, instead of asking the questions about ownership, Instead of asking the questions about public finance versus private financialization, right? All of these questions are the context of a new economics and a new economy. John Sorry, D. Erickson. You got, up, you got me up on my uh, soapbox here. No, well, that's, uh, that's what we brought you here for. John D. Erickson, professor of sustainability, science and policy at the University of Vermont, author of The Progress Illusion, Reclaiming Our Future from the Fairy Tale of Economics. Thanks so much for your time today. We'll put a link to that at majority.fm. Awesome. Thank you.